Hello, welcome back to the shrine. I'm about to unleash a wholesome engineering content on you you didn't know you needed. Today we're gonna talk about clutches. These are ubiquitous clutches you can find in almost every motorcycle or scooter. Uh, this is a smaller one, that's a bigger one. You can order these uh, for peanuts basically from China. We'll talk about disc frictional disc clutches and why these clutches can slip or what are the ways they can fail. Um, as I told many times I'm working on an engine design and one of the vital parts of that engine is this clutch. So I purchased a couple clutches that are available on the market and I went ahead and dissected them I measured the components inside and basically plug it in my calculator to see how much torque these clutches will be able to carry before they slip. This particular clutch is being used on small Honda clone engines, that is a Honda Cub clone. They come in various sizes. They range from 50cc to 70cc, 90 up to 125cc. You can ask is the torque the same on 125cc than on the 50cc and the answer is not. 125cc engine is gonna have a lot higher torque than a 50cc engine just by the design of the engine. It's a larger, larger displacement, it's burning more fuel per cycle, it most likely has a larger piston, a different crankshaft, a different inertia in a crankshaft, so obviously it's gonna have a higher torque. When the online stores sell these, they just basically say, oh, this will fit everything and it will work everywhere. Well, guess what? That's not a true statement. So the way this clutch is built is we got a housing and the housing has friction plates and clutch discs and it also has a hub and then inside it's got springs and those springs are compressing the stack together and the springs are so strong that I'm, I can barely able to push it with my fingers. You can see I can, I can do a little bit of movement but not much. And then the entire thing is being retained by this clip ring here. So I'm going to go and remove this clip ring, take it apart, and see how it's built. Press it down, and then I can go and release the tension from this clip ring. And now I can remove the clip ring. And once that is done, the clutch is free to move. So here's the clutch disassembled, not much to it. This is the clip ring that's holding it. It's about one and a half millimeters thick, not much. That sits in this groove in the housing. As you can see, we have four springs. So these springs sit in the housing like so. And they are pressing on the hub. This is the hub itself. So the hub is being preloaded by these clutch springs. Now one more thing I didn't talk about here is I, I took this apart earlier and there's four more springs in this assembly and those springs sit in this area here. Okay, so what these springs are doing basically they act as a torsional damper. So if the housing wants to revolve relative to the hub then these damper springs can compress so every time when you have a fluctuation in a torque in a drive line that would take the beating except whoever designed this in China didn't consider that the housing and the hub are solidly <laughs> tied together by these fingers so they're not able to rotate relative to each other.
<laughs> I'm sorry about chuckling, but that just <laughs> that just cracks me up. <laughs> so here is the original Chinese box. It came in. It says S125, and so these are the springs <laughs> that assembled there. Okay, so that that that's where the sing, these springs reside. You see, that's where the springs go. So there's four of them. And so again, the idea is that this is preloaded. The hub is preloaded by the springs relative to the housing. And if there's a torque fluctuation, you know, there's a there's a torque pulse in the system from whatever reason then these two can move relative to each other but you can see they are engaged by these by these fingers here so they're not able to rotate relative to each other so uh, you know this is just like a, a glitch in the Chinese copying process so inside the clutch we got two different plates here okay so this is called the friction plate. It's got the friction material on it. And you can see it has internal teeth. Now sometimes these friction plates come with external teeth. And then this, these are the clutch plates. So when you press these two together, that is what is going to carry the torque. And the amount of axial force that pushes them together will define how much torque you can transmit with the clutch. The size of the clutch disc will define also how much torque you can carry. So typically what we do is we go and measure the outside diameter of the clutch plate or the friction plate in this case. You can see it's you know 96 millimeters and then we're gonna go and look at the inside diameter of this friction material which is 72 millimeters in this case. So if you just take the average of those two so you add the 96 and 72 and then divide by 2 that is going to define this center diameter or center radius that's where this imaginary force acts that pushes them together and so that goes into the torque calculation so in this clutch we basically have um, one and then two and three discs. So in total we have six surfaces that are going to transmit the torque. So the six surfaces we typically use double the number of surfaces that how many uh, friction plates we have. So in this case we have three friction plates so that is going to be six surfaces. The amount of force comes from these four springs. So nominally the springs have a free length. So for this spring the free length is probably about 20 millimeters you know plus minus 10 percent or, or 1 percent uh, depending on where the springs are made, but you can see this is pretty much about 20 millimeters, 1996. The end of the springs are typically ground. One of these turns, the, the end turn, is basically seated. You can see that this end turn is sitting here. So if we count the number of turns on this spring, that's going to be one, two, three. So this spring only has three turns. The size of the wire is two millimeters and then beside that we just need basically an outside inside diameter and then we can figure out how much force this spring is going to give us uh, when we put it into compression. So this second clutch you can see instead of four springs it has six springs. This is not the complete assembly. Uh, I believe there is a bearing in the center here and when the clutch is actuated um, it is going to press on that bearing and basically it will um, provide a gap against the spring force so that the clutch 
plates and the friction discs can turn relative to each other. So there are six springs. You can see these springs are a lot beefier. So that's 2.6 millimeters. The length is about 33 and a half. And diameter wise it's about the same as, as the smaller ones. But the simple fact that this spring has a thicker wire that tells me that it will provide a higher clamping force. Also if you look here you can see this spring has one, two, three, four, five, let's say five and a half turns. So that previous one only had three turns. So if we take this apart you can see this clutch has one, two, three, four, five, six plates. So with the six plates we end up with 12 surfaces that can slip relative to each other. So this one is being sold as clutch assembly with six plates for 200cc, 250cc ATV. That's what the eBay listing says. And we're gonna go and look into this how much torque these clutches can actually carry. So in order to do that the first thing I've done is I went ahead and then took these apart and basically measured the friction discs and then I also measured the springs and I figured out what the compressed height of the spring when the whole assembly is put together and then based on that I came up with an amount of torque that this clutch can carry. Now most of these measurements you know anybody can do it. One thing that's missing is the coefficient of friction. So it is the coefficient of friction between the plate and then the friction disc. And that coefficient of friction can be a function of a lot of things. So it can be a dry assembly just as you see it here this doesn't have much oil on it. It's most likely just some rust uh, preventative oil from, from the factory. Both of these clutches are designed to run in an oil bath. So inside the engine there's a certain level of oil and, and so the clutch is submerged in it. And so a certain part, a certain depth of the clutch is submerged in that oil. That's why we have these breaks between the friction discs. So as you can see it's not a large continuous surface but it's got these indentations. So these indentations have just maybe half a millimeter depth but they are designed in such a way so that the oil would be able to come in here and lubricate those surfaces. You can see it's true on in both cases. So these are both uh, the friction uh, plates or friction discs and you can see that uh, the design is similar. They both have this undulated surface. It's not a large continuous surface. So again it's designed for the oil to penetrate there and lubricate the joints. So now I have a calculation and 95% is measured data but again 5% is the coefficient of friction. Now I can go and look up textbooks but I'm really curious um, what the actual torque is. So in order to measure the torque I machine this stub shaft here so this stub shaft will interface with the hub as you can see and conveniently this end of the stub shaft is machined to 3.8 size. Now don't take my word on that because it should be 9.5 millimeters but it's only 8.9. You know again I wasn't going for precision here okay I, I wanted functionality. So there's a stub shaft as you can see that will interface with this larger clutch and I machined another stub shaft here that will interface with this clutch here. And so with all that being said and done 
we are ready to put this all back together um, tighten up the bolts um, you know put back this clip ring assemble it as it's designed to do put it in a lathe and basically measure the torque so let's go and do it see uh, what the torque will be with dry clutch and wet clutch conditions this is the setup I come up with so we got the late chuck holding the outside of the clutch which has the stop shaft installed in it there's a torque sensor here that's currently showing 2.1 and it just went back to zero we got an extension sitting in the drill chuck uh, held securely so once I turn the lathe on it is going to show the torque with which uh, the clutch is going to slip small clutch dry clockwise twenty point two counterclockwise nineteen point something got some 5W20 engine oil Castrol GTX high mileage with some leftover from one of the old cars seems appropriate for the task oiled up clutch assembled ready to go in a clockwise rotation it's about 11 newton meters I'd say 11 and a half newton meters so it looks like as the oil is seeping out because there is no oil replenishment the torque goes up Initially it was around 7 newton meters and now you can see it's to about 12. Here's the larger clutch. I'm just gonna gently hold it by the gear teeth. I have a feeling it's gonna have a lot higher torque connect the reader, turn it on, put it in low gear. Now one thing I noticed is when I bring the drill chuck in, if it's pressing, watch what happens, I can press the clutch with that. See it disengages the clutch. So I gotta make sure there is a gap here and the clutch is not disengaging. You guys ready? <laughs> <laughs> it's more than 40 newton meters. I need to tighten this up. This is the point when I'm contemplating maybe I should put on uh, safety glasses. But let's give it a try. And just keep spinning. This is a large chuck. I think this is not going to work because a yeah, dry clutch condition, this clutch probably can carry more than 100 newton meters and the range of this meter is 59 foot pounds. That is uh, 80 newton meters. So I'm going to go and loop this up and we're going to give it a try again. This is large clutch oiled up that's not good <laughs> didn't sound right I think this guy has a built-in torque limiter 
and it will move at 80 newton meters which is the maximum torque for this we're gonna go to the big guns and try this guy instead well needless to tell you that didn't go as planned as you can see the 3.8 end just sheared off I did not expect that plan B just went ahead and just cut this into a hex shape and that socket fits on it 16 millimeter socket so hopefully it will be stronger than my previous contraption I tried the breaker bar method something tells me this thing doesn't want to slip <laughs> look at that it just ruined the 16 millimeter socket that socket wasn't strong to begin with but now it's gone so clearly things are not going as planned this is my Eastwood give it all maximum 135 Newton meters that's what it's set to so let's see if I can make it to slip so you can see that it will slip but it will not slip at 135 and when it detects an overload it will turn off here's my trusty made in USA Craftsman the tool of all tools breaking bar and I can make it slip with this that's what it sounds like when a clutch slips you guys can have the best seat in the house when this slip happens so the clutch will definitely slip but not at 135 newton meters maybe if I give it a little bit more oil Who knows? Yeah, it's definitely more than 135 newton meters. So what I ended up doing is I assembled the clutch only with two springs. So I got four springs out. I only have two springs holding it together. So we're gonna do a test, see if we can record it slipping. Large clutch, lubed up, two springs. So it's going between 23 and 19 newton meters. Large clutch looped up clockwise direction. 21 and 26, so I would say 23 newton meters. So now I got three springs installed in the clutch. We're gonna repeat the test. Three springs large clutch counterclockwise and the torque is 25 26 which absolutely doesn't make sense let's go and see it clockwise the torque is fluctuating between 41 and 47 I ran it for a couple seconds and the clutch is already hot like a two dollar pistol so I think it needs some time to wear in and then it will get to that torque level that I calculated initially which was about 80 newton meters so I'm gonna put all six uh, springs back and then run it a little bit and see what happens installing the six springs um, it's back to I'd say 150 newton meters so it's not gonna slip even at 135 the torque wrench is gonna max out so there is some non-linear thing is happening with it but I think I'm gonna stop with the testing 
at this point this is my glorified Excel spreadsheet spring calculator so uh, this page is to calculate the spring force you can see it's a clutch assembly six plates 200 cc ATV on this side here I measured all the vital characteristic of the clutch springs so I measured the force and it shows in pounds when I compress it to 5, 10 and 15 millimeters and I converted it into newtons you know averaged it converted it to newtons and then basically calculated the spring rate the spring rate shows how much force the spring is going to provide at a given compression so 14.3 newton millimeters I also measured the free length the inside outside diameters uh, the number of turns and then um, the mean diameter so as far as the spring goes the wire diameter is something I can measure uh, the mean diameter the number of active turns and then the free length and then when the spring is built into the clutch it will have the first application height which is the compressed length and that is resulting 130.56 newtons of force and that's per spring this is my summary page here I have four clutches that I evaluated there's a Honda CB350 there's the 200cc uh, clutch that I just spoke about there's the 70cc the smaller clutch and then there's a Yamaha R6 that I looked into this first section here shows how much torque the engine is gonna crank out and then we have the primary gear ratio which is a gear ratio of the you know the, the gears between the clutch and the uh, crankshaft in case of the Honda clone you can see it's one because the clutch sits right on a crankshaft and then the torque on the clutch is being calculated you can see by far that Honda clone has the lowest uh, amount of torque so next is how many springs are being used in a clutch outside inside radii and then the effective radii and then one spring force from the previous tab and then the axial force which is the product of one spring force and the number of springs and then number of friction surfaces as you can see it's 12 uh, in this case and then coefficient of friction so if let's say a coefficient of friction is 0.1 and I'm running two springs the calculator shows about 15.7 newton meters and we measured 21 now if I'm running three springs then it goes up to 23 so clearly the coefficient of friction must be higher than that because we measured around 44 so that would be 0.2 let's say 0.2 is the coefficient of friction so with three springs you can see it's 47 we measured 44 and then with two springs um, it's 31 and we measured 21 so something's fishy going on with this clutch it's a non-linear relation and it should be a linear relation what I theorize is that the friction material on the clutch is getting softened with higher pressure and so it's it's not a, a solid piece but somehow it's behaving non-linearly um, as far as the smaller clutch uh, you can see that uh, we measured 11 and a half newton meters and the tool is predicting 10.8 so that's a that's a pretty good um, correlation and that's with 0.1 coefficient of friction thanks again for hanging out with me in the workshop today hopefully you learned something about clutches if you like my videos and you're not subscribed yet please do so and if you like my content, please spread the word. See you on the next one. Bye.